Hey, everybody. Welcome to this Rewind episode. This is one of my favorites with Paul Merriman and Richard Buck. We are talking about how to supercharge your retirement, something we are all interested in, especially right now as we're in the midst of the stock market bumping up and down uncontrollably. How do we protect ourselves in the future? Take a listen. I hope you enjoy. Hi, this is Paul Merriman. This is Richard Buck. And you're listening to the Earn and Invest Podcast. My grandmother was sick, really sick. And after multiple hospitalizations, she barely made it to the rehab. A month later, it was time for her to go, and she was still weak and debilitated. And we decided to send her to an assisted living, and that's where the magic happened. She got stronger, she got involved in the community, and she lived the next three years of her life there comfortably before she died in hospice. So when I gathered a little bit of money together at the beginning of my career, and decided I would invest in a Roth IRA, I took my parents' suggestion. They said, invest in what you know. Well, I didn't know much at that time. I certainly didn't know about business, but I knew about this assisted living that had done such good things with my grandmother. And they were a national chain. So I took that $2,000 from my Roth IRA. I bought stock in that company and I left it there. And 10 years later, it was worth less than I originally put in in the first place. So I realized that I had a lot to learn about investing, and I was studying to be a doctor and busy, so I did the next best thing. I hired a financial advisor. And that financial advisor took my money and put it in a series of stocks and bonds and mutual funds and convinced me to buy some insurance And it did better than the original assisted living investment. But 10 years later, when I started to learn about personal finances, I realized that it performed a few percentage points less than the S&P 500 had over those 10 years. So I educated myself and I read and I learned about personal finance and I decided to make my investments simple. At that time, I was looking on the Bogleheads forum and I learned about the simple three fund portfolio. And so I took all my money, put it in the three fund portfolio. And since then, it's done very, very well. But this really begs a question, my experience. And I've been muddling through this ever since. First of all, is investing complex? Or is it simple? And second of all, can we really beat the market? And speaking of beating the market, where do you go nowadays to get your most up-to-date personal finance information? I used to go to books or podcasts, but I've been spending a lot of time on websites lately, and one of my favorites is WallethHacks.com. Jim Wayne created WalletHacks.com to help demystify money. You can learn everything there about credit cards, banking, investing, insurance, loans, you name it, it's there. Recently, he had an article called Buy, Borrow, Die, Estate Planning Strategy. And estate planning is one of those things we often get caught up on. It almost feels like the black box of personal finance. So if you want to know more, they offer no products, no services, just information to help you become better with your money. And best of all, it's free. Go ahead to WalletHacks.com. That's W-A-L-L-E-T-H-A-C-K-S. Dot com, and don't forget to sign up for their free newsletter. Richard Buck is a journalist, editor, and a writer who first joined up with Paul Merriman in 1993 as a publications manager. Since then, he has published multiple books on investing as well as contributed to many well-known periodicals. His partner, Paul Merriman, is a financial educator, author, and podcaster. He is a nationally recognized authority on mutual funds, index investing, asset allocation, and both buy and hold and active management strategies. Their newest book is titled, We're Talking Millions, 12 Ways to Supercharge Your Retirement. 
Richard and Paul, I'm honored to have you on the show today. Well, thanks so much, Doc. It's really a pleasure to be here. It is exciting to have you both on. And while I was researching the show, I realized that you guys have been partners, especially in writing for decades. I feel like there's a secret to every partnership. What makes it work with you? Why does it work so well, Richard? Well, you know, that's a pretty interesting question, Doc. And I was thinking about this the other day, and I thought, Paul and I somehow have this ability to just work with each other, build off of each other with ideas. And when I was working for Paul at one point, I thought, okay, what I do is easy. And there's obviously other good writers, better writers than I am. So let's hire somebody else to do some of this stuff. And we hired or we tried out several major people, you know, with really good experience and credentials. and they do what I was doing. So there's some there's some sort of magic here. I don't know quite how it is, but I think we just work really well together for some reason. Paul, how did you and Richard meet? Well, I don't exactly remember the moment in time, but he wrote, uh, was the finance, personal finance manager, editor for the Seattle Times. And somehow, because I was in the business of looking for ways to get some some exposure working with writers there would possibly get me an article ab- about the work that we were doing. I think that may have had a part of it. I don't know. Rich, do you remember it differently? I remember exactly how it happened. A friend of mine, this was in 1989, I think, and a friend of mine, I told him I was going back to New York City on an assignment to do something about the two-year anniversary of the Great Crash of 87. And this guy said to me, and he was, he was I don't remember his name now, but I've, I'm sure you know him. He said, my advisor had me out of the market before that, and I didn't lose a penny. And I thought, really? Who's your advisor? He said, Paul Merriman. And the name sounded vaguely familiar. I decided as a reporter, I better find out who this guy is. So I called you up and asked if I could come and interview you. And, and I sat down with you and Jeff, and we did a small story about what you were doing, and you were starting some mutual funds with timing, and I thought that was pretty darn interesting. Rich and I are about the same age. Some of us lose our memory. Some of us don't. (laughs) And I am the one that has lost the memory, and Rich has the most amazing memory. I think that's an important part of our relationship. Well, Paul, let me jog those memories more. The thing about a good partnership is that you each come to it with different philosophies. Tell me over the years how you think your philosophies have influenced each other. Well, as as Rich mentioned, Rich and I got to know each other when I was in the part of the industry that helped people with timing. We helped people know when to be in the market, when to be out of the market. And yes, he was right that that ended up being a real important part of my exposure to the public because after having having all those folks out of the market in 87, I got on Wall Street Week and Nightly Business Report. And then the business grew and we then added buy and hold to our approach to helping people so that we could do both. And so Rich and I were actually learning to, together. I was a teacher. I know how to get up and talk for six hours without stopping about how to be an investor, whether you want to be a buy and holder or you want to be a market timer. I'm very emotional. Uh, somebody once said, boy, I love your presentations. You're just like Professor Harold Hill. And I thought, well, is that a compliment <laughs> or not? But I do love teaching. Rich, on the other hand, is cool, calm, collected, puts the thoughts together carefully, and it it, it really helps me learn when I work with Rich because I'm the hotbed of information, and he's the cool guy that puts it together in a really great way to help people learn. 
Well, Richard, the magic of your partnership really shows in the number of books you've published. Let's talk about the current one that's set to come out soon. It's titled, We're Talking Millions, 12 Ways to Supercharge Your Retirement. Millions is not a small word. And you guys talk about several steps that could each possibly net you a million in the future. Is that an exaggeration? Can these little changes we make, especially when we're young, really equate to millions extra in retirement? I don't think it's an exaggeration. I think it's probably a little bit fanciful to imagine that if you do these 12 things, you're going to get $12 million and you can sit back and do nothing. You have to put the capital in and you have to keep putting it in. And not every one of them is going to work perfectly because we just can't predict the future. But I think that each one of them, and we've done our best to demonstrate it in the book, each one of them has the potential for a young person who, who does the few things that, that we prescribe, each one of them has the potential to be worth a million dollars. Now, if you're only saving 100 a year, you're never going to do it. But if you can get to saving several thousand dollars or five thousand dollars or ten thousand dollars a year, a million dollars, I don't think it's out of the question. You know, it 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 is surprising to, when you understand how little it takes to add a million dollars to what you have at the end of a 40 or 50 year saving program. It takes making one half of 1% more. That's all it takes. And in some of the 12 ways that Rich and I write about, some of those are multiples of a half a percent, which means if we do the right thing from day one, and that's what we're focused on. We're focused on helping people who don't have a lot. Rich and I worked for rich people for many years, and, and, and we, we were responsible as an organization for managing $1.6 billion when the firm was sold. Well, we weren't working for people putting away $5,000 a year, but that is our focus today. But it's just each one looking for at least an extra half of 1%. Paul, I feel like this book is a real evolution in your thinking process and philosophy. You are known for the ultimate buy and hold portfolio. Tell us what that is and why you pivoted to two funds for life, because I feel like there's been a real move in a different direction. Well, there there are a, a couple of forces that made us move to a less complex way of managing money. When we were professional money managers, we used a strategy recommended really by academics. I just tried to make it easy for people to understand where we combined 10 different asset classes. And with those asset classes, you could build a portfolio with the right uh, mixture of big and small and value and growth and U.S. and international. And it was fine because we were doing all the work for the client. But when in 2012 I retired and started my financial education foundation, my job was now to educate young people to do the same thing, to manage 10 different funds and to rebalance and all of that. And I tried actually to do that. And I continue to do that, by the way. But I do remember a meeting with John Bogle back in 2017. June of 2017, I spent 90 minutes with him in his office. One of the, the greatest 90 minutes of my life. And one of the points he made to me, and others had made it before, is that your work is good. He used to be on our radio show every year. So we knew each other. He knew what we did with all of these uh, asset classes. He said, you can't ask people to do that. It's too complex. They won't do it. He said, we have trouble getting people to stay the course with two mutual funds, and you're asking them to work with 10. And we had another uh, person on our, our nonprofit uh, operation in, in, the, in the research end who was working on developing 
these simple portfolios like the two funds for life. The fellow's name is Chris Pedersen. He's, a, he's, he's amazing. He's done great work. At the end of the day, Bogle was right. Our work now is way more impactful to the first-time investor than what it is I came away from my professional life helping people do. Richard, speak to that a little bit more. I know, based on the story I told at the beginning of this episode, that complexity was something that scared me. And if you had come at me at that point and said, well, there's these 10 asset classes, I think I would have gone back and run to another financial advisor and just parked my money there. Do you think complexity is the major issue facing young people today and why they're afraid of investing? It may be. I I'm a little bit removed from uh, a young person that I once was, but people have so many things that they're trying to do that they have to do. It's mind boggling all the distractions that everybody has. So I think very few people are going to want to spend much time thinking about investing. They just want to be told, do this and it will work. And then they do it and go on to live their lives. And I think they should. We had written a bunch of books. Paul came to me two years ago and said, I want to do another book. And my initial reaction was, well, I don't really want to do that. I'm, I'm enjoying being retired. And you know, we've written the same things over and over and over again. I don't want to just do that. And he, Paul persisted. He told me what he had in mind. And I thought, now, if that works, I want to be in part of that. I had preached the 10 asset classes to a bunch of people. And everybody thought, yeah, that sounds pretty good. Nobody would do it. I wouldn't do it. I tried doing it on my own recently. And it's kind of complex, especially when you have to rebalance. So this program, even though it might not be technically quite as effective, this gets you most of the advantage of that with only two mutual funds. And I th- and I think it's important to note this question of complexity. It's probably not that young person's fault that it's complex. Because if they met one person with a lifetime of experience that the family trusted, and they went to that one person and that one person told them, this is exactly step-by-step step what you should do. And the odds are, and it's it's all about faith at the end. The odds are you'll do well. You may not be the best, but you'll, you'll, you'll live the way you want to in retirement. Then what happens is they leave the trusted advisor today and they go out into the world and there's Wall Street. Wait a minute. It's not that simple because if it was that simple, we wouldn't have a business. No, no, no. Let us show you how to do this. I just got off the phone yesterday trying to help a lady who's 70 years old and her husband had a very successful business and he sold it in the late nineties and Wall Street somehow found out he sold that business. And by 2008, they were broke. They went from eight million to nothing with the help of not only Wall Street, by the way, but the emotions that people can get tied into with investing, which is the biggest enemy of all, I think, is your own personal emotions. So it's only complex because the people who want your money need it to be. It is actually dirt simple. You really only need to not, you don't even need two funds. You can do it with one fund. We just think if you'll add a second fund, it will be a supercharger to your portfolio. Paul, we're going to come back to the simplicity of the funds. And I want to talk about why you constructed the two fund portfolio the way you did. But first, Richard, I want you to follow up on what Paul just said. You know, Wall Street may not want you to follow these simple portfolios. You guys are in the financial advice community. Do you get pushback from other Wall Street personalities saying, how could you be pushing this? I don't, I don't have friends in, I don't have many friends who are brokers or advisors. So I don't get that kind of pushback. I think the, the 
the Wall Street thing, you know, a story that I like to tell that I was smart enough that I could just continue making my own decisions and I could do better than everybody else. I could beat the market. And it took a long time for for reality to beat that out of me. While I was working for Paul, even though we were writing about, you can't beat the market, blah, 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 I still believed that I could. And I had uh, a subscription to the Value Line Investment Survey. And I was convinced because that I was making some money buying little stocks. And then a time came when we had to uh, start reporting all the buys and sells that we were making. We had to write that down every quarter. So I had to start keeping track of this. And after a few quarters, I started realizing I am not making the money that I thought I was. My brain was just focusing on the profits. Oh, I'm so smart. I made a profit on that. And I was losing more. And so I finally just gave all that up and gave in to what Paul was teaching. And I've done better and I've been happier ever since. Paul, Richard talks about this idea of whether you can beat the market or not. And part of the reason that simpler portfolios have become in vogue is this idea that you can't beat the market, so let's just mimic it. My friend J.L. Collins wrote the book, The Simple Path to Wealth, and really pushes the idea that at least if you're going to invest in one stock, VTSAX, that's the total market index from Vanguard, will get the job done for you. and. I talked about the idea of discovering the Bogleheads 3 fund portfolio, the idea of having a total market index, having a total bond index, and then having an international market index. Talk to me about the two fund portfolio and why you think it's better. Well, first of all, I want to say that that J.L. Collins' recommendation of the total market index as a way to access the stock market is an excellent one. It is proven. It turns out, and this may be a secret because for some reason people think it's a special fund. It turns out the S&P 500 has virtually, the for 92 years, it's had the same track record. So what it's about is a large company index, big companies that represent most of the corporate value that we all know about, whether it's in the U.S. or the international, because there are similar kinds of indexes there. Now, the problem here is that there actually is a similar study going back to 1928 that looks at smaller companies. And it turns out that smaller companies make a better rate of return at a little more risk, not much, but a little And particularly if you look over time, you wouldn't even see the difference in risk over a long period of time. And then even beyond that, there is the the history of value companies, big value companies, small value companies, companies that are out of favor. It turns out that going back 92 years, they too provide a premium making more money than the total market index or the S&P 500. But when we talk about value and when we talk about small cap, we're talking about asset classes that are more risky. So this is not about any magic. It simply is about an exposure to risk that is higher, especially on the short term even if they look very similar in the long term. But it's the short term that people are are kind of weak-kneed about and and, and cash in because they're so afraid. So John Bogle would say, hey, you got to deal with that short-term emotion or they're not going to be a long-term investor. But what if we could educate people to the implications of combining that small, combining that value along with the large companies? It turns out that it looks a lot better for people who are willing to accept some short-term pain for maybe an extra 1% or, in some cases, 2% a year gain. And I was looking for a half a percent. Just give me an extra half a 1% for these young people, and I think that I'll be able to help them, or they'll be able to help themselves to a better return. 
here's a potential of 1% to 2% more, and that's worth knowing about, and that's worth accessing, and we let people do access both the large and the small and the value in our two funds for life. So to put this in investing lingo, the idea is to follow the overall market, but then have a small cap and a value tilt is what we would say. And in this case, something that has changed, I guess, in the last few decades is that companies like Vanguard now have index funds that have that small cap value asset allocation. So you can find all of that in one fund. So again, looking at either a total market index or an S&P 500 index will cover the large caps and the general market. And then you can find just one other index fund that will cover the small cap and the value. Yeah, I had to have one other thing that that, uh, I could add to that. On the cover of our book, the subtitle is 12 simple ways to supercharge your retirement. The supercharge means you've taken the basic target date retirement fund, which is the market, and gradually with some bonds coming in as you get older. And the supercharging is for small cap value fund. So what we're trying to do is take a simple, an absolutely simple and very reliable investment vehicle and supercharge it with a small cap value. You could supercharge it with something else. You could supercharge it with just small cap. You could supercharge it with large cap value. And it's that supercharging that's the key thing here. One of the things we're not going to go into huge detail about, but just for reference purposes, the two funds you're talking about, one is a target date fund and the other is a small cap value fund. The reason the target date fund, I think, is at least twofold. One is that it rebalances itself for you, right? So we talk about yearly or quarterly rebalancing your funds. The nice thing about a target fund, especially for someone who wants to set it and forget it, is you can use the target date funds and the fund automatically works on rebalancing over time. The other thing it does is it moves towards a bond allocation, which as you get older, can help you reduce risk. But In our case, the target fund really is approximating the market in general, and that's the part of the two-fund portfolio it's playing. And I think it is so important for young people to know the evidence, because if the evidence is strong enough that that target date fund is a smart thing to do, not for the next week, next year, next decade, but for the rest of your life, here's a piece of information dug out by a very large research organization looking at 1.2 million accounts at Vanguard. And those 1.2 million accounts were all in 401ks, all had access to target date funds at Vanguard or or regular mutual funds. Some of those 1.2 million had all target date funds. Some of them had some target date funds. And the rest had no target date funds. They, those were the people who felt they could do it better, I guess, on their own. But here's the evidence. Those people who were all target date funds made 2.3% more than the people that had no target date funds. And those that had some target date funds made 1.7% more than those that had no target date funds. And for people who are worried about complexity, worry about when do I buy this or that, when and why, and I get older, when do I need bonds, and all those things that happen along the way, they all get taken care of for you by the target date fund. So they are the least complex investment instrument that was ever, ever invented. All around the world, tech companies are innovating and driving returns for investors. Our crowd analyzes companies across the global private market, selecting those with the greatest growth potential, then brings them to you. From personalized medicine to cybersecurity to robotics, quantum computing, and more, in state-of-the-art labs, startup garages, and anywhere in between, our crowd is identifying innovators so you can invest when growth potential is greatest early. 
Our crowd's accredited investors have already invested over $1 billion in growing tech companies, and many of their members have benefited from the 46 IPOs or sale exits of their investments. Now you can truly diversify your portfolio by investing early in innovative private market companies at our crowd. Join the fastest growing venture capital investment community at ourcrowd.com slash EAI. That's O-U-R-C-R-O-W-D dot com slash E-A-I. So Richard, this is a controversial idea. I really had it hammered in my head that you cannot beat the market. And in fact, one of my keys to figuring out how to invest was letting go of that. As you talked about letting go of it as you were working with Paul. But the truth of the matter is maybe by having a small cap and value tilt, we can actually beat the market. Is that what you're saying? I don't think our goal is to beat the market. I think our goal is to have people do the smart things, to use that target date fund that, as Paul says, that is the basic thing. And if you did nothing else but that, you would be better off than many, many, many people. And so we're trying to supercharge. You could call that beating the market if you like. But I think of beating the market as applying my ability to choose a manager, my ability to choose stocks, my ability to do timing. That's what I think of as beating the market. And this plan of ours may have the same effect, but it's not employing the smarts and the hard work and the intuition. And I think that this whole concept of of beat the market, we need to look at that carefully because it, you may not think of it this way, but I see it as there are three basic goals that we might have. One is I want to beat the market. That's that's a legitimate thing. People do that. Other people might say, wait a minute, sometimes the market goes down 50%. So if I was down 40%, I would have beat the market. That's not the that's not what I'm trying to do. So my goal is to try to get the best return I can within my risk tolerance, which means we have to try to understand the risk tolerance. And the third way is to find the lowest risk way to achieve your long-term goal and forget about beating the market. Forget about getting high returns. Just get the return that you need to get where you want to go. But the market, the market keeps being the focus. Well, Dr. Smith wrote a book in 1925 or 26 It was the first public kind of book that talked about uh, a new market in in a sense. The market was the stock market because what people knew was the bond market. And Dr. Smith said, you know, there is a premium. You make more money if you invest in stocks. Well, that was news. And for the first time, the public knew that it was a good thing to do to buy stocks. Well, guess what they did? They bought them right before the crash in 1929. So it didn't work out so well on a short-term basis. Long-term, it did if you had any money left. The market needs to be well-defined. We are not beating the market. If you say large cap blend, oh, well, that's one group of stocks. That's an asset class. We know how to do well in that asset class. S&P 500, total stock market. Somebody else said, but what about this other asset class? Oh, that's a a totally different asset class. It's kind of like comparing bonds to stocks. So it's a different asset class. What we want to do is we want to get the return of that asset class. We are not trying to beat that asset class. And I think it's very important, Doc, to know that we're talking a conservative For a lot of people, just put 10% into a small cap value, 90% into the target date fund, and that should or could be in itself with that little extra risk, a life changer. Richard, what Paul's talking about reminds me that if we look at your book, We're Talking Millions, and concentrate only on beating the market or even on two funds for life, we really miss some important life lessons. And I feel like one of those big life lessons is find a simple, easy portfolio and start as young as possible. In some ways, that's almost more important than actually getting the specifically right portfolio. Well, one of the things that's interesting to me is 
a little bit nervous about the complexity of saying, here's these 12 things you got to do. And then we get to 13 is, or maybe it's number 12. You, wrap, you do all these things, you wrap it all up and you just make one decision, which is the target date fund. And that turns complexity into simplicity. It turns the complexity of all these things that you got to be thinking about into the simplicity of what you have to do, which is basically you buy this one fund and you've got it all. But I think it's important, this idea of starting young, to see some of the numbers in in the book. I'm not going to bore you. I love numbers. I just love them (laughs) because they tell a story that you, you, you could tell about somebody getting rich and living in on the coast of something. No, I just want to talk about what does a dollar a day over a lifetime turn into if you get a market return that you would get from the S and P 500. And it turns out to be about $2 million. And, 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 and as you, as you continue uh, to look at what you would get, if you started at 21, at, at, at 40, at 50, you end up with very little. And the magic, the magic, the thing that the people who read this book, we hope will understand about themselves they hold the key that Rich and I long for, and that is time. They have the ability to let compounding do its work. And again, I go back to that extra half of 1%. It's, it, it, it's working for a very long time and makes a difference. When I teach high school kids about compounding, I ask them, what do you pay for a piece of bubble gum these days? And I'm ready for their answer. It's going to be five or 10 cents. And I just, I go off the wall. I'm upset. I can't believe it. They're being cheated. I only paid a a penny when I was a kid. (laughs) And then I said, what do you think a five cent piece of bubble gum is going to cost in 2000 years? Well, they have no idea of the, of the impact of, of compounding and time. And so I get them guessing. Sometimes I even get up to a million dollars. And they can't believe it would be more than a million dollars for a piece of gum. No, it's $2.3 trillion billion. And the piece of gum is smaller. I mean, it's, <laughs> it's a story I hope they don't forget. The power of, of, of compounding is just huge for these people. And it's why I, I encourage so many parents to help their children start young and I've, and I've helped a lot of them do that. Get them working in their teens. Give them that. Take advantage of that time. Richard, is there any risk in preaching simplicity, even if we're talking about two funds for life, a target date fund and a small cap value index fund? You still have to pay attention to your portfolio. Over the years and the decades, you have to decide how much to put in each asset class. You have to decide what your target date's going to be. At some point, you might have to decide whether to reset it depending where you are in life. And then at some point, as you do get close to retirement, you have to start thinking about what your goals for that money are. Is it just going to support you for the rest of your life? Are you going to leave something for your children? Are you going to use it for philanthropy? Is there a risk that we're training people to drop their money in one fund and never think about it again? Well, I don't think that's a huge risk, Doc, if they put their money on into the right thing to start with and put their investing on automatic, this might take you, oh, an hour or two to set up initially, and then an hour at most every year to take a look at it, monitor it, maybe rebalance a little bit. You don't even have to spend that much time. So I think in terms of what you're going to do when you retire, I don't think that's a problem. I think people, when they get closer to retirement, they mostly will yearn for retirement. Get you know, get rid of that boss. Can't wait to get out from under. And so I don't think that's asking too much of them to figure out what they're going to do with it. I think another risk of simplicity, and maybe the biggest risk of simplicity, is that if you do it wrong, you are going to be in one asset class 
And every asset class goes through a period. And I was thinking about this when you were opening the show and telling the story about how, you know, things went at one time in your life and another time in your life. There's a lot of luck or whether it's good or bad that goes into this process. Let's assume that J.L. Collins was talking to somebody, for example, at the end of 1999 and telling them, here is this fund that has uh, uh, at least in hypothetically a 10% compound rate built into it over the last 90 years or whatever it was. And then they invested. And for the first 10 years from 2000 to 2009, the compound rate of return was about a negative 1% a year for both the S&P 500. Well, <laughs> obviously, he doesn't know what he's talking about. And the, here is the problem with simplicity. This is why I love the 10 funds. You've got 10% each of 10 different things, and they go up and down at different times, and it's supposed to overall give you a decent return. But you've always got a winner, but then you always got a loser. With one fund, one asset class, you're going to go through long periods, even with stocks versus bonds. There are lots of long-term periods. The T-bills beat the stock market, the, the S&P 500. So too simple, risky because of people's expectations that they want what they want when they want it, and the time is now. That is not the way it works. That is not the way you get the premium for risk over a lifetime. There's this idea of reversion to the mean, right? So the problem with short time periods is we see anomalies, and the longer you hold on to those assets, the more likely the returns are going to revert to the mean, which in the case of the S&P 500 or the total market index is pretty darn good. But if you catch yourself in one small time period there, it can really look like you're getting poor returns. Richard, I'm sure you guys started writing this book before the pandemic hit in full force. Do you think the economic futures of young people have significantly changed or has any of your investing advice changed because of what we're going through today? It's a very good question, Doc. And it's so difficult to see the future. It's so easy to think, well, our, our long-term future has changed now because of this pandemic and all the fallout from it. I think the economy is is going through some basic changes right now. How that falls out, I don't know. But you know, when fifteen percent of downtown office buildings are occupied, that is just very. That tells me there's a huge change going on. When people are working from home instead of working in the office, and they can do this living anywhere, these are going to be lasting changes. And I think some of these changes will last, but how that plays out, it's just impossible to tell. Well, and I think uh, my concern is not for the market. My concern for those young people today would be their ability to save. That is going to be tested. We know people that make very little money are able to save and others are not. I mean, that is, uh, there's an interesting discussion around that whole topic. But here's the other part of what I'm not concerned about for these young people. I can't know the future, but I do know this, that when markets are down, out of favor, and you have the ability to invest, you should be celebrating because you are dollar cost averaging, buying more shares of great companies like the total market index or the S&P 500 or to whatever it might be. You are not buying, hopefully, Enron or Washington Mutual or something, an individual company that could go broke, but a diversified portfolio. Celebrate bear markets, young people. That's the greatest opportunity. Put a bear market together along with a long time to let it go and, and build and make you tons of money. The best timing advice that Paul ever gave me is just ultimately simple. And ever since I started thinking about it. I just think it's brilliant. He said, invest when you have the money and take it out when you need the money. And that is so absolutely reliable. And when I do that, then I just don't have to worry about it. You know, right now I've been investing a little bit of money, the market's way up. Well, I've got the money to invest. So there it is. I'm just doing what Paul wants. <laughs> 
<laughs> okay, wait, but but I want to be careful because half of advice sometimes is bad for all situations. Most professional advisors will say, if you're going to need that money within the next three to five years, you should not be in the stock market. So people like me at age 77, my wife and I are 50-50 stocks and bonds. And so we have half of our money very carefully, low risk investment exposure, and that's okay. But the stock market, I, I would expect that if I'm putting money into the stock market today, it's for the long term, not for the next three to five years. You talk about repeatedly in the book, Paul, the power of percentages, of small percentages to make a difference, whether that is increasing your return a little bit with a small cap tilt, whether that is investing in fees that have very low cost to maintain. You just a second ago said most advisors, and you've given us a hypothesis for a very simple asset allocation that pretty much anyone could follow. Another one of those percentages where we tend to lose money over many years that compounds is using financial advisors. You have been a financial advisor for many years. Tell me what you tell young people about paying for financial advice. Well, my hope is that through our work and people like us, and I know lots of other folks who write amazing books on how to invest for the long term, my hope is they'll be able to do this on their own. When you think of being able to go into a target date fund at, at Vanguard for 14 one hundredths of 1% fee, and a little more for maybe for the small cap value. That is a bargain to begin with. When I came into this business, there were no index funds. There were no low fee funds. Today, we have these amazing securities for young people. Now, if I'm serious about wanting to make you an extra half of 1%, how do you think I feel about 1% a year coming off the top to have somebody do it? And so that is a way to magnify your long-term return. Is it worth 5, 10, 15, 20 hours of education to learn how to do the right thing and save one half to 1% a year? Now, I want to make it, I want to make it very clear why that half a percent is so magic. When I talk about an extra half a percent, I'm talking about doing it for 40 years, let's say, as you're putting money aside. Then you retire. I'm still looking for an extra half a percent when you're retired. And if you make an extra half a percent and then you die when you're, let's say, 90 or 95, what is the impact on how much you take out and what you're left with. Those are the only two ways you can measure how successful you were with your investing over a lifetime. And if you apply that half a percent, I'm not just talking about an extra half percent until you're 65. I'm talking about an extra half a percent for the rest of your life. We're talking millions. And I think that's the reason why I want to drum that idea. If there's a way to save an extra half a percent or 1%, do it. But you got to do it right. And not paying an advisor is one way that's slam dunk. Absolutely. It's, it, it's, it's, it's guaranteed if you do the right thing. And I can tell you right now, if you go to Vanguard, they'll charge you 30 one hundredths of 1% to manage your Vanguard funds for you. So they're not charging a 1%, but they're charging you 30 one hundredths of 1%. I know what they recommend to people. It's simple. It's basically the three fund strategy. And, and, and why pay them when you can just buy those funds and not pay them that 30 one hundredths of 1%? More magic in the making. And I'll note that Paul and Richard, you guys put out a lot of your books for free. I think they're freely downloadable on your website. So my hat's off to you because clearly this is information that you're trying to disseminate, especially for young people so that they can make the right decisions. 
And we do supply free books. We're talking millions to teachers and to the kids in, in college and at, at, in high school. We would love to get a million books free in the hands of the youngest of, amongst them in the hopes of changing some lives. Absolutely. But the money we do get from the sale of the books, it all goes to the foundation. I don't get any of it. Rich doesn't get any of it. It goes to the foundation. So Richard, sum it up for us. If you were to give young people a single piece of advice about their finances today, what would it be? And also tell us how we can get in touch with you or learn more if we're interested in interacting with you. Well, my my one piece of advice would be to get this book, read it, and do what this book says. If you've got a job, do that. Keep it simple and don't try to think that you can beat the market and do it yourself. That would be my one piece of advice. If people want to get in touch with us, they can always go to uh, Paul's website. And I don't know if my contact information is available there, but they could always email me at rich.buck at yahoo.com. And I'm always willing to talk to people. Paul's probably a little bit better than I am at that. He's got a lot more experience. I say probably a little bit better. He's worlds ahead ahead of me at that, but I'm always willing to talk to people too. And Paul, give us your one piece of advice to young people, one parting bit of knowledge that they can take away from this podcast and make sure you also give us the web address for your website so they can download all of that good information. Uh, Sure. First of all, the advice that I would give, because saving is going to be the major hurdle. You read our book. We have no question of what you should be doing with that money. The question is, what should you do to make sure that you get it? And Warren Buffett says something that I think should should be important to all young savers. Don't save what's left over after spending. Spend what's left over after saving. Pay yourself first. My email address is paul at paul Merriman, and the the website is paulmerriman.com. I I hope lots of you will come visit and test us, test drive the kinds of information that we have to offer. I will tell you, it is all in your best interest. Our pay, our income is a psychic income that comes from believing truly believing that you're going to do what we're recommending and be better for it. I love that. Don't save what's left over after spending. Spend what's left over after saving. That's amazing. The book is called We're Talking Millions, 12 Ways to Supercharge Your Retirement. On behalf of myself, Doc G, I'd like to thank Paul Meerman and Richard Buck. Thanks, Doc. It's a pleasure to be on your show. That's a wrap. The simple truth is I was afraid. I was afraid to tackle investing on my own. I figured out budgeting. I understood how much money I made a year. I knew how to save. But the thing that scared me most about managing my finances was investing. And so I started to read about it. I started to look at blogs and I came across the White Coat Investor. You guys know that I had read the White Coat Investor book and that had pushed me in the direction of financial independence. But while I was perusing the White Coat Investor blog, I found a post back from 2014 called 150 Portfolios Better Than Yours. And what was so amazing about this blog post is it literally listed 150 different portfolios and how they were all better than stock picking. And what it really taught me is that there are simple ways to go about investing. Look, Rich and Paul talk about two funds for life. That would be a small cap value fund as well as a target date fund. 
There are other great portfolios out there. I subscribe to the three fund portfolio. That is a whole market index, an international market index, and then a bond fund. You could do just a single stock portfolio like JL Collins suggests, VTSAX, that is the U.S. market total market index. And you could just invest in that stock alone, that index fund. And that'll give you tons of diversification and will also mimic the returns of the stock market as a whole. There are so many different portfolios out there if you're willing to get out and learn. And as Paul talked about in the show, the actual portfolio is not nearly as important as A, learning how to save so that you can actually put that money to work for you with compounding. And B, starting early. So I think we almost focus on the wrong things. We try to make our portfolio as efficient as possible. We try to beat the market, and we do this through complexity. But the truth of the matter is, simplicity wins the day. When it comes to investing, if you have a simple portfolio... If you have a simple asset allocation that's well diversified, it's going to serve you fine. What's more important is that you start saving right away, and then you do it when you're young enough to let compounding work for you. Don't let investing stand in your way. Don't get scared by the complexities of the stock market, and don't necessarily buy into what Wall Street is trying to tell you, that it's complicated and that you have to pay a lot of money to be invested appropriately. This is simply not true. I didn't know it until I read up on it. I didn't know it until I found the White Coat Investor and read about 150 portfolios that were better than mine. And maybe you wouldn't know it either until you listen to this episode of the Earn and Invest podcast. And that's exactly what we're here for. To help you live better, learn, and in this case, invest better. Awesome, and I made it through without having to. Run yeah, I was about to say you didn't. You didn't. Yes. We we didn't. Our conversation didn't elicit spontaneous diarrhea. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad to hear that. Hopefully, you guys feel like this encapsulated a lot of the good in your book without going so far into details that it made it boring. The idea for me is to pull out the ideas to get people interested, so they'll go and get your book. <laughs>